Hi, everyone. This is Alexi Gambis. I'm the Artistic Director of Imagined Science Films. And I'm very excited to have you all today for this uh, inaugural event uh, here at Imagine Science. We're all, some of us are quarantined, some of us are not so much. Everybody's in a different status uh, during this crisis. But um, we're excited to be able to continue showing films and science films here at Imagine Science. We decided to organize this uh, live series, um, which will be conversations and screenings that will be happening uh, a few times a month. Um, we're doing this in partnership with a streaming platform called labocine.com, which is a platform dedicated to science cinema in all of its shapes and forms, documentary, fiction, animation, short and long. We also um, really embrace scientific footage. Uh, we have a whole initiative called Scenes. And this will be a series where we'll be showing films, uh, sometimes fictions, documentaries. Uh, we'll be announcing those on labocine.com live, as well as on Imagine Science. And, uh, and I also wanted to mention that we will also be hosting the 13th annual Imagine Science Film Festival. Uh, this will be happening from October 16th to the 23rd. And um, initially there was a lot of trepidation about organizing the festival, how to organize a festival online, but I think it's a big um, responsibility on our part to communicate science, especially in these times. And um, ironically, this will be the biggest festival we've ever had. We'll have around 20 feature films and about 80 short films and stay tuned for, for those announcements. I'm very excited to be here today uh, with Mark that's gonna come um, in a few minutes. Uh, Mark Levinson is a very good friend, um, a filmmaker. I'm gonna read a little bit about him uh, right now. So Mark is the director and producer of the award-winning doc feature that you may have heard of called Particle Fever about the discovery of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider experiment outside of Geneva. Before embarking on a film career, Mark earned a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Brown University and a PhD in Theoretical Particle Physics from University of California, Berkeley. In the film world, he first became a specialist in the post-production writing and recording known as ADR, working on over 40 films, including some of the films you may have heard of, The English Patient, The Talented Mr. Ripley, Cold Mountain, Seven, The Rainmaker, The Social Network, which is very timely because we're on Facebook now, uh, his directorial debut uh, was a fiction film called Prisoner of Time, which is a story about two former Russian dissident artists after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mark is known for being a wonderful science communicator through film. He's won the inaugural Stephen Hawking Medal for Science Communication Award and the inaugural Robert E. Sieves Leonardo da Vinci Award for his work at the intersection of cross-disciplinary work in art and science. He's currently working, and we were just talking about this, he's working on an ad adaptation of Richard Power's award-winning novel, The Goldbug Variation, and I know that he's been in quarantine and working on this feature film, and, and we're very excited to have, to have Mark today. Um, before we begin, I thought we would start by showing the trailer of The Bit Player. I wanted to keep, keep everybody aware of the fact that the film is going to be playing only today on La Bocine, so make sure that you catch it. Um, it's going to be on labocina.com live, and it's momentarily paused as we have this conversation with Mark, and then it will resume right afterwards. Uh, so let's watch the trailer. Who's Claude Shannon? Who's Claude Shannon? Claude Shannon? You're asking me this question? We live in the information age, and Claude Shannon is the father of the information age. In the last couple of years, we've generated more information than the sum of all of human history. The fact that you can contact an Uber, place a phone call, text a friend, and then check your email, all of those things you owe to Claude Shannon and his work. He's at the same level as Newton or Einstein. Why don't people know about him? His impact is bigger than all of the household names. To measure information, you have to look at it without meaning. Content is irrelevant. That upset a lot of people. Coin toss is the simplest form of information. Heads or tails, a one or a zero, a binary choice. A bit. And that was the revolution. Back in the 1910s and 20s, he had what we would probably call now a free-range child rigging up a barbed wire telegraph, learning wigwag signaling, sending Morse code flags. Shannon lays this idea that machines could be made to think. He himself invents devices that mimic a brain. There's the mouse that can navigate her maze, the computer that can play a chess game. My dad tried to fool with everything a little bit and see if he could make it more fun. He knew how to juggle and he taught me how to juggle. He 
was like an artist. He didn't sound like a scientist. Not at all. Who makes a flaming trumpet? A rocket-powered frisbee. When Shannon's paper came out, it was like a bombshell, like Newton coming out with the laws of motion. For a long time, people didn't really understand what this was all about. Engineers thought it was so far removed from anything they could build, they just basically thought it was science fiction. It took decades for people to find those codes that Shannon promised existed. Everything that Shannon predicted back in 1948 came true. Learning things, discovering things. He didn't lose that childlike curiosity and delight. Practical or playful. He was into understanding. What would the world look like if Claude Shannon hadn't done what he did? Mark, welcome to, uh, to the Imagine Life series. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to be here, Alexi. I'm absolutely happy to uh, launch this whole new venture with you. How, how are you doing? Before we begin, I just wanted to ask you, which is, you know, everybody asks these questions in these strange, strange times that we're living. How, how have, have things been on your end in the last, in the last few months? Um, well, surreal, of course, um, but uh, I'm in New York City, and, and I've actually been hunkered down in New York City, so for a while it seemed like we were the epicenter of everything terrible that was happening with the virus, and now, you know, we're actually not in a bad shape. I mean, it seems like, you know, people are, are being conscientious, and uh, I've been working on, on some new projects, so, you know, interestingly, you know, that first phase is often about writing, and research, and so I've actually been able to do that. I mean, I have a new film that we were going to, you know, it's a doc, and we would have probably been doing some interviews. Um, so now it's a very theoretical film right now, so uh, it's been an interesting experience. I'm sort of writing a, a, a script, um, you know, which is a theory of a film, <laughs> and um, we'll see uh, what the experiment turns into. But. Um, so, Mark, th this brings me to to a question that I have, and, and I think you've been asked this before, but, you know, we, we oftentimes, you know, this happens to me a lot, um, you know, because I've also bridged, you know, science and film, but do you, do you see any parallels between, because I know that you have a background in physics and, and theoretical physics, and, and of course, you know, this idea that film is also kind of like an, an experiment, right? It's kind of like being a, an experimentalist in some ways. Do you, do you find or do you feel that it's a little bit forced to, to say that sometimes, you know, some people will say like, oh, you know, Mark switched, you know, from, you know, from being a theoretical, theoretical physicist to then doing ADR, that these are different chapters in his life. Um, but do you see any, any narrative in, in how you kind of went from one, like these different episodes uh, of your life? Or, or do you feel that it's something that is maybe imposed on, on your career and it's not necessarily the case? I, you know, it, it is a question I'm asked a lot is, well, how do you go from theoretical physics to um, filmmaking? And, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, when I was doing it, I wasn't even aware of it. Uh, it was actually really when I started, when I really started working on particle theory, in a sense, I started really thinking back on it and, and I actually realized that there are a lot of parallels. First of all, I mean, one of the things I would say, and I'm sure you found this too, is, I, I mean, you know, there's a creativity in both filmmaking and, and, and uh, you know, frontier level scientific research. And I don't feel like it's two different sides of my brain. I mean, of course, I'm sure that my brain works in certain ways having that training. But I realized, I began to realize that there's a lot of parallels in terms of the process. So I was a theorist um, and, and from a very practical standpoint, I'd say, I, you know, as a graduate student in theoretical particle physics, I was sitting in a room by myself with a pencil and a paper uh, trying to come up with theories of how the universe worked when I, and not getting paid anything as a grad student. And then, you know, I started working on a script and I was sitting in a room again by myself with a pencil and paper working on a script, which in some sense is a theory of the universe as well. Um, still not getting paid anything. Um, but, you know, I, for me, films are something that, uh, like a physics theory, it's you're trying to abstract something about how the work the world works, and in a more compressed form, that is a simplification in one sense, but hopefully representative of something much more general. And that's I think what you're doing with theories in science, and with a script. 
And, you know, I, I'd say there's also parallels in the, in the way a, a film gets eventually realized because with a, in, in physics, you have a theory, you start with a theory, and in film, you start with a script, which is a theory about a film. And then you go in science, you go to the experiment. And suddenly, um, as opposed to the theory stage, which is very solitary, the uh, experimental stage in, in physics is uh, usually involves many more people, uh, lots of equipment, it's expensive, um, and uh, you basically hope you come out with uh, good data, any data, and with a film, you go into production, and suddenly you have a crew, and you have all these other people involved, and all these other influences, and it's expensive, and you hope you come out with some sort of useful footage, um, and then you know, in the science community, then you take the data back to your theorists who actually often have to revise their theory and say, okay, this is the real world and this is what we have. And in film, you go into the edit room and you figure out what the film is that you really did make. So I think there's a lot of uh, parallels in the process uh, of, of science and in, and in art. Mark, I think the, the internet is lagging a little bit here. Can you still hear me? I hear you, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so so let's talk a little bit about um, let's talk a little bit about the, the bit player. And um, you know, the bit player is about you know the father of information theory. It's about Claude Shannon. Um, it's a it's a very, you know, what I what I love about this film is that it's extremely complex and it's very hard to put it into a box, right? To to really identify what type of film is it? How, how do you define the film when, when you talk to people? Because there are so many elements to it. There's, there's the documentary aspect, there's, um, there's fictionalized moments, there's, um, there's a sit down interview, there's the animation. How do you define it? Because I, I always feel that when we're, you know, when we're in situations where we screen films, everybody wants to always put us into a box, right? This is a documentary film. How do you, if you had to best you know, I guess when you do an elevator pitch about the film, how do, how do you describe the film? And I remember yesterday we were, or a few days ago, we were talking about it and you said, oh, we, we tried many things. We were experimenting with how, how to tell the story. What, what, how would you define this film? I mean, I, I call it a hybrid. Um, <laughs> so it is interesting. I mean, I think you raise, you raise a very practical question is that from the film world's perspective and in particular film festivals, uh, I, I think they are very particularly, um, I don't know, prone to categorize things. So it, it did come up, you know, when I was applying to festivals. Um, I, I, you know, I, from the film uh, world perspective, I thought of it as a documentary um, in terms of, you know, I, my initial instinct was, oh, I should apply to documentary film festivals. And when I would pitch it to people, it was a documentary, but, um, I began to realize uh, that personally, when I would tell people, um, I would really emphasize the hybrid nature of it, because once that became the way that I was going, I did feel it was sort of a limitation, and, and you know, I, I, I didn't see it as a traditional biopic. You know, so people also want to characterize something, oh, it's about a person, it's a biopic. And, and, and then that has its own associations, because then people say, well, biopic, is that just like you have actors, you know, because typically, a, you know, a biopic in the fiction world is, okay, you have actors, you're telling a story. Or documentary-wise, there's a certain typical narrative, too. And, you know, I, I didn't feel comfortable with either of those. Uh, so I, I, I prefer to call it a hybrid, which is what it is. And that was, you know, once I sort of set on this route, um, it was an experiment. I mean, um, you know, we see we see dramatizations have been happening in more and more in documentaries. It used to be really rare. It's starting to happen more and more. Uh, honestly, I think it's often not done well. And so I was wary myself of doing it. Um, uh, and, you know, I hope I've succeeded, but um, it was a risk because, you know, I, I found myself when I was first thinking about doing it, I, I, I thought, what, what are you doing? You, you don't like these things. Why are you doing it? Um, and I think the thing that um, convinced me or, you know, reassured me is that I was going to be working with a uh, text that Claude Shannon actually said. And so I think, you know, in that sense, the, the, the origin of the idea was 
when I discovered these uh, transcripts of, of interviews with him and, you know, as, as a filmmaker doing one, I said like, oh, damn, I wish, you know, um, there was footage because I, that would be gold to have this old footage and it didn't exist. And so that in a sense was the origin of this idea of, well, well maybe I can recreate that interview. I mean, you know, because there were things that came across in that that just were not there. So uh, 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 that was in a sense the origin of the idea, but then it did really become a question, oh, geez, are you gonna do one of these things? Are you gonna do something with recreations? And, and that, that whole, um, you know, worry of how some of these things come out. Um, but I think, I think a lot of times the reason that these uh, recreations of documentaries don't come out is I, I think that the writing doesn't feel authentic you know, they also don't often have good acting. You know, they don't have the resources to make a fiction film the way it should be and, or the experience. So I, I was hoping since fiction was my metier, that is the world I came from. And I had really the dialogue of this. I wasn't gonna be, you know, for the most part inventing dialogue, you know, okay, people, you know, it, it'd be hard for people to argue with the dialogue was wrong when it, that's what he said. <laughs> Now, but Mark, so did you decide, um, let, let's, I'm going to probe you a little bit more on this. Did you, did you decide when you had access to this, inter this was an interview in, in Winchester, right? In Massachusetts that he did in the, was it the 80s? In the 80s? The 80s, yeah. So did you decide, you know, as you were, as you gathered all of these transcripts of, of this interview, did you decide this is a part that I want to visualize? Um, these are excerpts that I actually want the actor to say as a sit-down interview, how, walk us through the process of deciding what, what, or did you have an idea of this is probably going to be an animation, this is probably going to be reenactment, or was that something that came, you know, more in the editing process? Um, because that for me is, is fascinating that you started with this transcript and then you started creating images or, or not creating images and just kind of sticking with, with the the sit down interview what was what was the process like on, on that end yeah the process was so so it was um it, there were actually several, a couple of interviews that were done so first of all it was not one there was one primary one that actually was done um by the ieee um uh the institute for electronics and electrical engineers that was one of the sponsors of the film um through the information theory society so they had just done this for their archival purposes um that um uh was conducted by somebody who was a scientist. And so um, there were some very technical parts to it. Uh, he was very interested in more technical things. So, but it was done in his home, in Shannon's home. And, and the thing that struck me was, as you see in the film, Shannon was really less interested in talking about the technical things than showing him all these devices. And, and so um, the idea was that I would use, uh, what I really wanted to, ca to, to capture was the, uh, the sense of Shannon as a person, the playfulness. And that was complemented by some other interviews where other people had gone to his house. And so the, the approach that I had was to, uh, as a script, a script. And so again, you know, uh, I had actually only made one other documentary, which was Particle Fever, which was um, in some sense, the opposite of this was a, a very verite film where we were, you know, there was an experiment happening and nobody knew what was going to happen. And we were often just shooting things, not knowing what the story was. Here, I felt like I could sort of try to construct a narrative. And so that was the, that was the challenge. So when you say, well, what was the first step? The first step was looking at these interviews, looking at all these interviews, reading about Shannon. Could I construct a narrative that could be the backbone of the film where I would say, you know, you know, uh, there's a sort of a story and there's a sort of story arc in his life. Could I get that? And so I did have to uh, craft it from different things. There's grafted, and I had to do some writing, you know, to make it work because obviously just an interview, you know, I didn't just make a film of the, you know, 90 minute interview or something like that. So that was the, I, I actually did write a script. Um, so it was maybe my theoretical background, <laughs> but I wrote a script that, you know, I indicated, um, here's what I would do where I, I could use something from the interview. Here's where uh, 
Um, maybe we'll have to cut away to somebody who can talk about this because Shannon himself in the interview, of course, wasn't explaining his theories and things like that. So, so I did construct a script where I then allowed places where I'd say, okay, this is where I need something. Um, and it could be, uh, hopefully I'll find somebody that can do this. And there were, you know, there were enough things about him and some people that I knew had talked about him that I could imagine there were quotes that I would see. I said, oh, this person says something here, I'll try to interview them. Um, I'll try to interview this person. And so I had a very rough idea. And then um, in 2016, it was uh, the Shannon Centennial and Bell Labs had a big event. And basically many of the luminaries in the field who knew Shannon came. And so that was the first filming that I actually did where I just, I basically just did a series of interviews and we just sort of grabbed these people and I did interviews. And then that allowed me to refine my script. So I said, okay, this is what people are really saying. And so then I did a more refined script and said, okay, I now have this part that I could do in the recreation and, you know, it would tie into this person and this person. And so I, I had a more elaborate script where I had now some real interviews. And then I had my idea of what the fictional piece would be. And then we, uh, I refined that. And then we went and um, did the filming of the uh, recreated interview. So, um, you know, I, I sort of, they, they sort of intertwined and, and uh, um, you know, affected each other. And so once I went, because I knew once I did the filming of the recreation, I wasn't going to go back and reshoot. So it had to be as refined. Then, of course, I went back and it was a, a very iterative process. We got to the edit room, we had those things. And then I realized, okay, I need more interviews but those are easier to get and I could really start to structure that narration. And then the final step was um, realizing what was gonna be needed with the animation. And, um, you know, refining that was, that part of it was really more of, uh, accomplished in the edit. What, what I find amazing, Mark, is that a lot of these decisions that you made are also they're, they're not completely arbitrary, right? Like the, the idea of Alice in Wonderland was because Claude Shannon had a fascination for, you know, for, through the looking glass. And so many, many of these decisions that you ended up using also kind of stem from, you know, kind of from the character in, in, in some cases, which, which I find amazing. And something that I just realized now is there was, a, there was a line that Claude Shannon says in the film, which is that the best way to communicate information is not shouting louder it's by actually providing the information in in different permutations right in different ways and in some in some case i mean this is a bit of a far stretch but in some in some ways you're also talking about his life through different way through different forms and by doing that you're kind of solidifying the information right he yeah i would just remember that quote where he said you just have to kind of say it in different ways and then you have to have a proofreading aspect to it, which you know is kind of smoothing it all out. Um, so I find that your approach, in a way, pays justice to his theory in in a in a, in a kind of in a beautiful way. So, well, thank um, you. I, I'm, I'm hoping he would have approved. Actually, yeah, no, it is. I mean, I think it's you look for alternatives. I mean, you know, it, you know, he was about coding. He was about finding the right code, and I think that's what you know. In some sense, you could say filming is is about finding the right code to convey your message using whatever you have. And that's, and that, you know, fundamentally is my perspective. I mean, well, Particle Fever too, Particle Fever, um, you know, was my first documentary. Um, and so I really didn't know a lot about the tropes and standards. And, and you know, my editor, Walter Murch, also um, had not done a feature documentary. And so we approached it, you know, the way we would a, a fiction film with characters and story and using all the tools of film making that we could. You know, there are people in the documentary world that don't agree with that, that you know, uh, say, no, no, you shouldn't be doing anything like this. It, it should, you know, just be strictly what's there. I, I fundamentally don't agree. I think, you know, my point, my, my purpose is to convey a story. And, 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 you know, of course, I don't want to outwardly lie or manipulate things, but you use anything you can. And, and this was, in a sense, another, uh, even taking it to another level, is that, you know, Okay, I don't. There's not a lot of footage about Shannon, but I have all these things, and 
you know, can I use this to tell a story? And what can I use? And, and as you pointed out, it is interesting with the Alice in Wonderland, he gave me some really nice gifts. And it's interesting you bring that up because I actually didn't know if he was really interested in Alice in Wonderland, but I guessed he was. And so I actually had this in a first version of the script already. I had this idea he probably would be interested and I could use Alice in Wonderland. It could be a theme for us in the animation. And the first time I went up to the house and his son, Andrew, took me to the house, there was that poster of Alice in Wonderland. He said, oh yeah, my dad loved it. <laughs> so it was, um, you know, it was one of those things where uh, it was very serendipitous actually. That, uh, was you channeled Shannon. You 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 knew you knew the character so well that you could start inferring some of his. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's watch. Let's get into a little bit the story. Let, let's watch a little clip here. This is a clip that explains, and and I feel like it it also is a patchwork of so many different the interview, the animation, um, where it's a little bit about the history of the bit. I mean, obviously, you know, huge. You know, the father of information theory is is such a. You know, when, when people watch this film, it's like, oh my God, Shannon is responsible for everything that we have today. So I just wanted to show you, show everyone this little clip and, and then if anybody wants to watch the film afterwards. And so let's play, uh, let's play the first clip of, about, the, about the bit. Amazing, Mark. So, I mean, there, there, there's so much going on there. There are so many different elements uh, to that piece. I, I wanted to, uh, well, you know, I wanted to make this a little bit interactive. So I'm just going to start by one of the questions that just came in, actually, which is, um, why did you decide to use an actor? What, what was the, what was the idea behind that? Why not use, um, what was the, yeah, what was the kind of the, the well, I mean, I there's there's very very little footage of Shannon, um, actually. Um, uh, nothing really when he was younger. Um, and, you know, uh, I was struck with either I just have people, you know, talking heads, talking about him, the traditional thing, you have stills. Um, but, you know, there's also not a lot of people that knew him that were alive personally. And so very, very few people knew the character of this person that came across in the interviews, the playfulness. And so for me, um, you know, what really was exciting to me about telling his story was not just telling the story of, uh, you know, telling the story of information theory. I mean, you know, I'm not, I was not interested in a technical film that was just an explain this. The idea was, uh, and I think this was from the IT society as well, to, to make his story known, but also from my perspective, it's, it's again, um, inspiring people. And Shannon's life to me was uh, an inspiration. And it gets to this point of, uh, the support of science uh, without particular goals, but um, out of curiosity. And uh, he had this curious nature of a child that he never lost. And sometimes it revolutionized the world, sometimes it made a, a flaming trumpet. And so I wanted to capture that. And so how do, how do you do that? Um, with, the fact is hardly anybody knew about this side to him. I mean, it was really interesting, you know, Robert Gallagher's in the film, and who's a very esteemed um, information theorist himself. And he was, um, you know, he collaborated with Shannon and, you know, he talks about how he was very shy when he first went and talked to him. And they collaborated and worked on papers together. And he didn't know until he saw the film that Claude Shannon played the clarinet. And he said, what's really astonishing is he played the clarinet. So, you know, uh, people didn't know about the side of his life. And so I, I thought, okay, do I just have a narrator tell it or can I actually uh, recreate it? And, you know, I had also seen pictures of his house and that room filled with all these things. And so, you know, I thought, well, you know, why could I recreate it and could I try to capture it? And so, um, so that was the motivation was I, I just didn't feel that in a traditional, with a traditional biopic way with uh, voiceover and with uh, interviews, talking heads, I would actually be able to capture that story. Mm -hmm. So that was really the motivation to, to be able to really convey what this person was like. Well, what, what's also fascinating, Mark, is that you take this actor and you embed them in the environment of Claude Shannon, right? We were speaking about this earlier, which is that the room that he's in, you know, oftentimes we see in documentaries, you know, there's 
you know, kind of like a standard way and people do, you know, with like a black screen or, you know, green screens or whatever. But here you embed him in an environment that is filled with actual props and inventions and manuscripts and archives and photos um, that are of Claude Shannon. And, and I don't think I've ever seen that before, actually, where you, you have somebody conducting an interview in an environment that is completely um, factual. Um, what I also found interesting, and maybe just like a, you can comment about that, but we often, you know, sometimes maybe interviews can be a little monotonous, right? Like they can be a little bit dry, but you have these moments where he gets interrupted by his wife mm -hmm. or the, the interview person suddenly comes into the frame. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Like these, these interruptions in the, in the flow of information that happened um, over the course of the film where suddenly you have the wife that comes in with coffee or he calls the wife to explain thesis and you know the beginning of that robotic mouse uh, maze and um, because he has a bit of memory loss and he needs his wife to help him. So yeah, tell us a little bit about, about those aspects. Well, so the wife thing, that actually was accurate. That's the way, I mean, the, the transcripts of the interview were very accurate and it really recorded this. So Betty really was there and, and this is exactly the way she would, she performed, you would see, you know, and of course it was just a written transcript, but you would hear, you know, they would like, oh, Betty off camera or Betty comes in and does this. And so, you know, some of the things were maybe invented a little, but, but some of them are exactly what she said. Um, so a lot of her dialogue is also real. And, and, and yes, I mean, I hadn't mentioned, but you, you pointed out, this is the real house. And so that was one of the other things. And so when I began to think about it, also, I did start to think, you know, oh, you know, that's the, one of the other drags of, of recreations is the set and things like that. And so I, I, I was able to contact um, uh, Andrew, the son, and uh, well, actually first Betty. Betty was alive, actually. Unfortunately, she died before the finishing of the film, but she was alive when I first called. And I said, do you still have the house? And she was actually living in a facility. She was, you know, very frail. She was still very sharp, but she was very frail. And her first comment was, do you want to buy it? <laughs> and I said, well, that, I, that's not exactly a budget I have. Uh, um, but they still had it. It was very, uh, it was pretty barren. They had really removed a lot of the things, but it was still there. And uh, Andy, Andrew had a lot of the things. And uh, so they said that I could shoot there, which was a great bonus and then uh, we had pictures of what the house looked like and uh, and Andrew had a lot of it and so we were able to really recreate the environment actually so uh, as you point out almost everything in that is real and is really Shannon's things um, mm -hmm. some of the major pieces were at the MIT Museum and they lent it to us um, um, and uh, uh, it did give something to be in that environment. I have to say, I think everybody affected that. I know John Hutton, the actor, and even the crew talked about feeling like you're in this hollowed ground. You're in this place where Shannon himself did do these things and said these things. And it gave a, a, an incredible sense of realism and responsibility to it. Um, so uh, I, I think that was important. So, so it was in the real environment. You know, in terms of the interviewer, I mean, this was a question, you know, I, I, I felt we needed somebody, you know, I couldn't just have him speaking. You needed to be, he needed to be led on. And so again, this was part of the construction. I mean, uh, that part of it, but, but the wife and Betty, that was pretty real actually in terms of the way they interacted and the memory of, of you know, how they did certain things. And his memory was starting to go at that point. So he did rely on her to, to oh. fill in these stories. And she was critical to him. And you know, I wanted to get convey that too, that they were a real partnership. That you know, she was a mathematician. Um, she apparently did most of the wiring on, on a thesis and, um, and rewrote a lot, you know, proofread and you know, was uh, you know, the first audience probably for a lot of his later papers. She, she wasn't around for the 48 paper, but then after she was. Well, Mark, I, I want to dive into this aspect of the film, which is, which is what you mentioned about getting a sense of Shannon, not only the mathematician, but his life, his, his environment. And I, you know, before we talk about, you know, some of the information theory and the Shannon limit, I want, I kind of phrase this as kind of like the limitations of Shannon or like the anxieties of 
of Shannon himself. And I wanted to play this uh, next clip um, that um, that kind of gets into a little bit of his personal life, especially his first marriage. Um, if we can just play that, this little clip. Starting with the fact that you have him walking through the hallways and he, uh, he sees Einstein, which, which I find to be amazing how you, you know, this kind of interweaving of, of archival footage with, with reenactment. Um, but walk us through a little bit this, these kind of, these moments in the film that are not necessarily about information theory, but about, about his own life, you know, and about, um, and about getting into that. And also in this clip, there's almost like a realization from the first wife that she learned something on camera about, about Claude Shannon and why the marriage, you know, something is revealed on camera. Um, but yeah, tell, tell, tell me a little bit about how you, the architecture of this, of this clip, because there's also a lot going on in terms of the narrative in here. Yeah, well, uh, you've chosen two very interesting clips so far, <laughs> representative of many different challenges and interesting. <laughs> this one, again, you know, and this is again an interesting aspect of my whole motivation is very, very little is known about Shannon at this time. Um, uh, I, the, you know, the Institute of Grand Study has almost no record of him, um, which in the end is not surprising. He was only there for a couple of months, but um, their archives, there was nothing in the archives, not even a picture, no pictures of, of him there, no real record of what he did actually at all. There were some letters. So, so it was sort of a black hole. And I really couldn't even find anybody who knew anything about him at the time because, you know, he was not established in information theory. So information theorists didn't know him. Um, you know, he didn't really sort of, uh, he, you know, of course, uh, um, you know, probably people from MIT knew him, but they were, you know, older people that were dead. Um, and the first thing I heard about anything about his life there was from Norma. And so, um, and, and by the way, I, there have been some people confused about whether she's an actress or not. Now that is Norma. So, you know, my, my convention was that, you know, if we have somebody's name and who they are, they're real. And if we don't, then they're, they're, they're active. So, I mean, it's really only the recreations. So Norma was alive and uh, Norma had an interesting life after she left. Um, she ended up making her way to Hollywood and she became a blacklisted screenwriter and uh, went to France, lived in Paris, then lived in the South of France for many years. She stayed there for quite a while. Um, and, you know, she sort of moved on with her, her life, but she was still alive and she, she had moved back to, she had a little place in Beverly Hills, she still lived there. And so uh, she had written, uh, she had, she talked about this. She talked about the fact that um, it was a very unhappy time for him. We really, we really didn't know what he did there. We knew he left pretty early, but there was literally no record of him psychologically, what he was thinking about, what he was feeling. He, when asked about it, he, he, you know, when, when he was asked about the Cooper Rand study, he didn't talk about being unhappy. He did talk about being a bit uh, shy and intimidated by Einstein. And the, the, the story he talks, what the lines he talks about Einstein in the film, there's in a little bit of a different section, he talks about, you know, how he was so excited to see him. And, you know, he would wave to him when he would go by. And he, he said, you know, he probably thought I was some sort of crazy guy. And that was what Shannon really said. It's great because the video Albert Einstein doesn't pay attention to him. He just continues right. writing. <laughs> and I think that was it. He said, you know, he doesn't think that, you know, Einstein really even knew who he was. Although he said that he did give a talk at one point and Einstein, he noticed Einstein walked into the back of the room and he whispered to somebody and then he left. And, and, um, and then, you know, I, Shannon was very self-deprecating. He said, yeah, I think he probably was just asking where the bathroom was. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, he didn't have much interaction there, but um, uh, so, so I wanted to convey that. Um, and, you know, I wanted to convey the sense that he was there, um, that, you know, uh, there was a little bit of intimidation about it, that he was doing something else. And then Norma filled in the narrative of the fact that he was very unhappy. But this idea that he left was one of those things uh, in filmmaking that happened spontaneously. And I knew, I knew about it. I did not know that I was telling Norma this for the first time. Um, so I was just saying, so, you know, then he just left. And, and you see, this was a really an on-camera thing where she's sort of working it out. She said, no, no, I, I didn't leave till, 
then. And, and I said, well, but he left before that. And it was, so it was one of those remarkable moments that was happening in real time where she did not realize and I was sort of revealing it to her. And, um, you know, the question, I was a little wary of uh, not having any confirmation of what his psychological state was. But then I also did the interview, or the interview with Maria, who he became involved with uh, after Norma, after when he was still living in uh, New York, when he was working at Bell Labs. And Norma, who actually became a psychiatrist, um, confirmed that, um, that he was very depressed for a certain period of time and, and, and uh, you know, that sort of confirmed that narrative. So, um, so, then, so again, it was, one of, it was a little delicate, you know, how do I do this? I'm, you, know, uh, I, you know, we don't have Shannon's own words. We know he was sort of uh, intimidated by Einstein. So I sort of tried to use the things I knew and the things he said with the things that Norma said. And mm. I wanted to capture the sense of him being at the Institute for Advanced Study. And, that, and this was another instance actually where we filmed at the Institute for Advanced Study and amazingly, the library has not changed. So wow. the library, if you notice the library that he's in at the Institute for Advanced Study, they still have a, a card catalog. <laughs> and so it was amazing. Another example where we could be in the real place. This is the real place. It looks the same. The only thing we had to do was that they, they had a bust of Einstein and we were able to move that out. And besides that, we had the exact environment again. And from the, the shot where you're down below and you see him walking out onto the green, it looks just like it did at, in, in those days. We had, to, we had to crop it because outside of that, there's modern buildings, but that central section, Fold Hall, looks exactly the same as it did then as well. So again, it was a matter of being able to include the real things, the things we knew about, uh, but then also a real interview and you know, mix all these things together to try to tell the human story, which is in the end, what I think also a lot of people are engaged with. And there's another question coming in here about what makes the film so powerful is, is precisely that, that you go from, go, you know, you get into his personal life and then you go back to, you know, to him working. The fact that it wasn't a, it wasn't a linear, you know, he had moments where he took pauses. You know, there's a moment where he actually didn't work on, on, on you know, on information theory for quite some time. So you, you kind of take these digressions following the course of his life sometimes when you watch films they, they trim those out right they want to make it into this beautiful discovery that was you know something that was like very clear and streamlined and and the fact that you make those those digressions are, are really beautiful and and I think you know for this piece what really worked also was the fact that she, Norma is narrating over your reenactment you know so in a way the fact that you hear her voice over it really adds to that and and that you didn't also shy away from her making realizations on camera as well, which, which, is, which is amazing. Um, let me, so let me ask you one question, which is, you know, of course, the, the biopic. Do, do you feel that, um, this is a very big statement, but do you feel that you, or, or from the, how long have you been screening the bit player for at, at this stage? Um, we had the big premiere a year ago, a little over a year ago, in, at the end of May at the World Science Festival. And so, you know, we've been taking it to best festivals basically since, you know, uh, since that point. And you've shown it at, I'm, I'm assuming you've shown it at film festivals, at scientific, con I mean, there have been many different types of, of gatherings, right, for, for the film. Yeah, I mean, some film festivals, some science, yeah, yeah, more science oriented things, film festivals. Um, you know, we had a big screening at the Computer History Museum. That was a that was a big event. Uh, um, you know, he's such a you know, especially he's legendary. A lot of people don't know about him. You know, and um, even in the field, it was sort of striking. Um, and this is an interesting question: Why is, for instance, Alan Turing is much more well known? And um, they really complemented each other. You know, in some sense, I mean, Turing really sort of came up with the idea of the computer. Um, and uh, Shannon came up with the, the language that you speak in some sense. Mm. Um, so um, what's been interesting is that uh, I think also about Shannon is he had, he had, you know, he had sort of these three big accomplishments, his master's thesis, where he realized that Boolean algebra could be used for circuits, which are parallel. 
um, the cryptography and the information theory. And specialists often knew about only the thing he did in their field and not the other things. And so um, that's been interesting, you know, taking it to these different communities. But um, yeah, that's sort of, I mean, so that has been the path. I mean, so, I mean, we had a screening, um, the, the National Security Agency actually, NSA contacted me. And that was a little scary at first. I think, wow, okay, what do they want? And um, they, somebody had seen the film, I think, you know, at the Computer History Museum and they thought it would be very interesting. And so I went down and screened it there. I thought it was gonna be from the cryptography people because he did do cryptography work during, yeah. you know, um, but it actually was a whole information theory group that wanted to see it. And, he, and, and, and they filled their theater. They had like a 400 seat theater, they filled their theater. And I, and I said, you didn't even advertise it to the cryptography people? He says, oh no, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to fit them. Uh, right. But there was so much interest in that. Um, and that, that's an interesting, it's a little bit of a diversion. There are people, some people have asked why, you know, why isn't there more about the cryptography? Um, well, we just don't really know what he did then. He did yeah. talk, you know, there's a, there's a segment in the film where he's asked about it and he says, oh, well, you know, I don't know, it's been long ago, but I really shouldn't talk about it anymore. That's verbatim what he said to the interviewer. Yeah. And um, when I went down to the NSA, they were very nice. And I met with a historian there and they, she said she couldn't believe it. She had done research for like a week before I came down there and could find almost nothing about what he did there. Yeah. So we know he did something, you know, um, but what, and he left pretty early. He didn't do, he didn't continue working for them, but she could only find records of like, you know, confirming his travel or his hotel arrangements or something the, like the, that. The, rec the receipts of travel. Yeah, exactly, that's all they could find. There was no written record. And even she said, there's really no reason this shouldn't be classified now. It just doesn't exist. So, um, so. There was a lot of unpublished work as well, right? I, I remember that there was. There was a lot of unpublished work, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. That was, you know, almost one of the most frequent questions I would get after screening is, well, where is this work and what's in it? And does it exist? And yes, in fact, when we were filming there, I wandered upstairs. It was this old rambling house. And upstairs, there were all these boxes of things. And, wow. you know, I don't think, you know, uh, I mean, the, the, they do, Andrew has them, they do have them. They're talking about turning them over uh, to the National Archives. Um, you know, whether there's something in there, uh, who knows, you know, I mean, I think Andrew doesn't think there probably is, you know, he wasn't really working on them, but, but you never know. I mean, uh, what could be there. So, um, so, so let me ask you this, Mark, what, because biopics are so, you know, you, you also told me at the beginning, you're like, what, you know, what am I entering into, you know, biopics, it's, you know, it's like people waiting to, to criticize you. And of course, also Claude Shannon died in, in the early 2000s, right? When, when did Claude? 2001, yeah. So because he's a relatively recent figure, I mean, that also, there's a lot of people that knew him. And um, do you think that you, yeah, do you think that you successfully achieved sort of a portrait of Claude Shannon? How did, I'm especially interested also in, in the family, what did they think of the film and, and how, do, how did people respond to this? I mean, one thing that you mentioned, which was interesting is that his different work, your film allowed to connect the dots, right? Mm -hmm. His crypto cryptography work and information theory. And in a way you, you were able to connect that with the film and realize that these were all emanating from the same person. But yeah, what, 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 what are your thoughts in terms of paying justice to, you know, to the father of information theory? I, I, I think I feel, uh, I think, I'm pretty confident that I really recaptured him. Um, and that comes from the fact that, um, first of all, when we were filming in the house, um, Peggy and Andrew came by at various points. And I, I remember Peggy was sit, standing in the outside room looking at the monitor. And she told me she was very freaked out actually, because here she was in her house um, where she grew up, recreated um, with somebody sitting there who looked and seemed and <laughs> acted just like her father saying things that she knows he said. Um, yeah. And so that was for me the best um, confirmation um, uh, that I think we did capture him. I think we captured him, the, the, the style, you know, I, it's interesting because some people have said, oh, well, you know, he's sort of sometimes slow and well, Okay, but this is the way he was at this time. Um, the other, there was another interesting episode where we had a screening at MIT 
And somebody came up to me afterwards and he was the architect who had helped Shannon build that room. So that room, the, the sort of the toy room was an addition um, uh, to the house. And yeah. he had worked with Shannon to build that room. And he said it was one of the best experiences he ever had. And he said, Shannon was so great and very insightful and um, collaborative. And he said, and he, he said that we absolutely captured Shannon. Um, and, and the final thing was somebody that I, when I was making the film, I had sent a little clip to, um, and, uh, I guess I hadn't explained what it was. And he wrote back and he said, wow, where did you find this lost footage of Claude Shannon? <laughs> so, um, so I feel, uh, in that sense, I think we captured him. Um, and I felt, uh, I feel, I feel good about that, you know, uh, that, that I think we did him justice. I think his humor comes across. Um, and I, I, you know, from people who knew him, there has been pretty, uh, pretty universal, um, approval of, of the fact that this was authentic to the way he was, uh, you know, it's interesting. One of the big challenges one has with a biopic is uh, a, a big question at the beginning is, are you going to go for somebody that looks like him or not? Right. And, um, you know, uh, it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, and we did, I, I was, I did audition actors uh, who didn't really look like him, but are just good actors, you know, yeah. and, and this gets into the economics of making a film and, you know, is it going to be an advantage if we have somebody with a name or something like that? And we did, um, we did interview some people and audition some people who had a bit bigger names um, and didn't necessarily look like him. Um, and it wasn't the overwhelming thing. In the end, we went with John um, because he, he, and John was mostly a theater actor that my casting director knew who came in and read cold. And he just nailed it right at the beginning so well, but John is bald. And so uh, there was a certain resemblance um, in terms of physical type. And I thought, well, that's fine. Um, but it was when we put the wig on him, it was such an amazing transformation um, <laughs> that, you know, basically you can leave all, we left all the pictures in the house are the real pictures of Shannon. It looks completely authentic and we could integrate, you know, we could integrate them and have not a problem. And I'm, and I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did not go with um, somebody that's recognizable mm. because I think that, I think that increases the difficulty of a biopic and, and of a recreation is if you're, you know, no matter what you think and no matter how good the actor is, I think it can be a distraction. And I mean, I know people disagree with that, um, but um, for me, I'm glad, I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad we had John because I think he did, a, he was perfect and he, the fact that he looks like him, I think, is a bonus. No, I, th I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, and others can debate about this, but I think that if you recognize the actor, it, it can sometimes take you away from the, from the biopic because you immediately associate the actor to, to a certain type of world. Um, but at the same time, as you were saying, if you have a relatively well-known actor, it could also elevate the story and, and, and it can reach more people. So it's uh, definitely a, a fine line. I want to I show um, one more clip hear about the Shannon limit um, before we, I wanna I want to squeeze this one in um, to speak about it. And it also kind of starts with a bit of archival photos of, of Shannon, if we, can, if we can just play this, this clip. So this brings me to, um, yeah, to, to this question. I mean, we're on, <laughs> we're here on, on, on video chat and of course people don't realize about the impact. And sometimes this is something that's quite hard to do in biopics. Um, I was just watching recently the a biopic by, by Marie Curie actually called Radioactive that also makes connections between her discoveries and, and Hiroshima and, and other aspects. But it's always a, a very delicate line, right? To, to connect a discovery that was made in a specific time to the future, right? And in this case, also the fact that he was the unsung hero, right? That he wasn't, people don't really recognize the name Claude Shannon. Talk, talk to me a little bit about, about that and about finishing with, with having people realize that everything that we have, all of these connections, the fact that right now we're living through a pandemic and we rely on information theory and, and we hope that we never you know, get to the Shannon limit. This is all, you know, all 
thanks to to Claude Shannon. And and how did you how did you navigate that part of the film about kind of future, you know, projecting yourself into the future? Mm. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, this is as you say. I mean, it, it, the things he the, laid the foundation for affect so much of what we just take for granted now. I mean, really, when you think just the whole idea of compression, uh, efficient transformation of uh, transmission of information, all goes back to him. And so we wanted to capture this, and you know, we're thinking about how to do it in an interesting way. And and I have to really call out my incredible uh, graphics and animation team, uh, Kirill Uretsky and, and uh, Gerta Schello, who were really fantastic and became real collaborators. And they worked with me for probably over a year on this. So, I mean, again, as I had said, once, you know, as the film began to take shape, they started talking to me and there was a lot of interactive activity in terms of what it's going to be. And this, that, that sequence was really one of the last that finally came together. Um, and it was a question of how do we show all these things? And they had, um, they, they had one of the first things they did, it was interesting, this is the one of the last, the very first thing they did was this timeline of communication at the beginning. And they had come up with this idea of this chalkboard, you know, that they, they, uh, they were showing it. And, uh, and so we had had this long idea, well, maybe we can do that, but let's give a sense of how do you do a timeline but you show all these things, you know, and, you know, conventional timelines are really, you know, just have something on there. And so they came up with this idea of it sort of expanding and then the idea of it turning into this sort of net and just having these little bubbles of all these things like that. And, uh, and, uh, and then you, we always had the idea of, you know, at some point we should have an image of Shannon that shows like, you know, the, 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 the bit aspect of it. And so, uh, you know, it's how does the creative process work? At some point, somebody said, well, what if these things all then all these different bubbles, we have all these bubbles and they just come together and then you see that it is Shannon. Mm. Um, so, uh, and it just was like, yeah, that, that seems like the right thing to do. So, um, that, you know, that's the way it came together. And, and you know, it was, you know, one of, the, one of the things was we didn't want to distract with what these things were, but, you know, uh, we had many things to choose from and uh it really it really does i mean it really i have to say even personally after i really found out about shannon i would actually i i did sometimes think about the fact that you know wow here i am i'm walking down the street with my cell phone and you know there's claude shannon is everywhere he's in your cell phones basically yeah 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 absolutely yeah, this, this brings me, so we're, I'm going to open it up to um, to anybody that wants to ask any more questions. We're going to wrap up soon because we can go, there's so much to <laughs> out here. But one question, which comes to what you were just saying from Doreen here, um, she was asking, are there any parts, and you can feel free not to fully answer, but are there any parts of his personal life that you decided not to include because you didn't have enough you know, enough to, to chew on or perhaps because family decided oh, we don't want this to be disclosed. You know, this sometimes happens when you're so intimately involved with, with the family. Did that happen? Was, was there some selection process that you had to consult with people or you didn't feel comfortable because you, you would have to resort to too much fiction? Um, I would say, I mean, just there is this central section uh, at, at Princeton that we just don't know that much about. And um, I felt like I couldn't do too much more. As I said, I was wary of, of just Norma having the account of that. And I think that is something I would have been wary about indicating, you know, what, what was his mental state there based on the re re recollections of the woman who divorced him. Yeah. Um, but um, when I then found that, you know, somewhat confirmation of his mental state from Maria, um, I felt that that was okay to indicate it, but to, I, I did not feel I could go into that much deeper. Um, the, the national security agency work. So again, it wasn't, this wasn't something where I got pressure not to do it, but I felt that there was not enough for me to speculate on and, you know, to invent something that he was, you know, uh, you know, solve some huge code that broke the, the you know, the war. I, that was, you know, I would, I couldn't do that. I felt, and you know, uh, I, you know, some people I think have asked why I've left that out. I said, like, we just don't know much about it, you know, and, and even his cryptography work during the war. So 
we know he wrote this incredible paper that um, uh, people who are in the cryptography world say, and many of them say, consider this the foundation of theoretical cryptography. But um, he worked alone for the most part. I mean, he really did. He preferred, he was not antisocial, as Bob Gallagher says, if you knocked on his door, he was very pleasant, he talked to you, but he preferred to work with his door closed. So there's not many people that know about his process. And so I, you know, we can only speculate on that from the outward things. Um, but um, besides that, I mean, so those were the things that I felt I, I didn't want to invent those things. I mean, I tried not to invent. I, I don't think there's too much that I invented um, that uh, there's not some account of. Speaking of inventions, when, when, you, when you look at Claude Shannon on Wikipedia, it says that you know, he discovered the, you know, the juggling robot, but it doesn't, it doesn't mention all of the other inventions and contraptions. I, I personally love the box that when you open it, it just closes on itself, um, which I thought was, was really interesting. The, it's interesting that you mentioned that, that, that this idea that the ability to fictionalize, that there's a certain threshold, right? That if you don't have enough basis, then you're entering into zones that you don't feel comfortable doing. And I think it's, it's definitely a bigger, a bigger conversation to have about, about docufiction and, and kind of thinking about these, these hybrid forms. So Mark, what, what's next for, well, let's talk a little bit to, to wrap up here. What, what's next for the bit player? I mean, I know that it's playing around, you know, we're, we're lucky to have it on, on La Bocine. Uh, shout out to IEEE for, for allowing us to show it as well. Um, yeah. What, what's next for this film? And then, and then kind of, no, we're trying to really just really get the word out to people. I mean, because I think there is a, it's interesting. I mean, I didn't know what the audience would be, um, but I find that, uh, I don't know, maybe there's sort of this intrinsic uh, interest in the underdog, so the un unknown story. And so even people who don't know about him, I find are really fascinated. You know, um, there was this book. So the interesting thing was there was no biography or film. Um, and then, uh, you know, Jimmy Sony and, and Rob Goodman wrote this book, you know, Mind at Play. And we, we, we sort of became aware of each other early on. And also really early on realized that we were complementary. We were not in competition. We both thought we would be finished like a year before we did. <laughs> we were both much later. Um, but I think, you know, the two of them were hoping it's going to get more attention. And, you know, there are these, I mean, you're probably aware of this. There are these... Um, amazingly popular YouTube science channels. Um, you know, Grant Sanderson has one uh, um, that uh, really do sophisticated math and science and there's huge audiences, millions for them. So I think, as you know very well, um, there is an interest in real science and uh, we are hoping to exploit that. And, you know, having, you know, having doing this with uh, Labocine and Imagine Science Festival and these other science festivals. And, you know, I, I'm hoping that some of these big YouTube stars, Grant has posted something, tweeted about it. Uh, there's many other really big ones. Um, there was, there was hoping... about Matt, Matt Damon as well that we were talking about. Matt Damon as, as Claude Shannon. That's right, yeah. I've got to get Matt to do something, yeah. And um, actually, I, I will mention that how one of the ideas of showing BitPlayer, I mean, besides the fact that I know you, Mark, is that I was listening to Godard, Jean-Luc Godard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and very early in, there was an Instagram, you know, he was on Instagram, like smoking cigars. It was an, ama an amazing one hour interview with Godard. But he speaks about Shannon. He speaks about DNA and Shannon. He speaks about how important, um, you know, Shannon was to, to thinking about his work. Um, we often refer to what we're trying to do in science communication as the science new wave, because this idea of, that it's really important to experiment. You know, it's really important to, to break the form of how science is communicated. And so anyway, I thought that was a really neat, um, neat kind of shout out from Godard. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you, you wrote to me about this and you said, look at this, you know, Godard talks about Shannon. I just was like, it just blew my mind. Yeah, uh, uh, so that's fantastic, yeah. <laughs> and, and Mark, so as we wrap up here, so you're working now, because um, I know that you know, the life, uh, so I understand that you're no longer doing theoretical particle physics, is that correct? <laughs> well, as somebody said, I do very, very, very theoretical physics now. 
<laughs> but yes, no, I haven't really done, you know, serious physics in a long time. I really consider myself, it's interesting, I consider myself a filmmaker. I, you know, for many, many years just was working in fiction films. Particle Fever was sort of my first, you know, reconnection, which I, you know, was exciting. It did really reconnecting me to this past and, um, and, and that intersection between art and science is what's really interesting. And, yeah. you know, as you mentioned at the beginning, I mean, I am working on this um, adaptation of uh, Richard Power's book, The Goldbug Variations, which for me is, you know, in, in the fiction world, one of the best examples of the integration of science and art in, in a story. I mean, it, it, you know, essentially a story of this molecular biologist trying to decode DNA who gets derailed by music and and the, the code for music and love and so um that's something i'm really still hoping to you know uh, transcend is where you know i think in fiction dramatic films science is still often gratuitous or obvious and what i'd like to do is a film where the science is integral to the story it's not just a part of it but it's embedded in the uh, drama, the perspective, and, 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 and that's what I'm hoping I'm going to be able to do with uh, the Goldbug variations. Super excited, and, and please keep us in, like, in the loop about, about that. And you're, right now you're in the writing stages still, right? You're still writing the script? I have a script. So we have a script that's gone through lots of uh, development and actually had some really nice support from Sundance and IFP and Film Independent. And so we're trying to figure out in the COVID world now, how we're going to make it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, I, and I, I do want to mention, I do want to do a shout out to Particle Fever. I mean, your first documentary, um, which is unbelievable and had a huge success and was edited by, you know, you mentioned in, in passing Walter Murch, but obviously he is the, you know, like the father of editing and we've all read in the blink of an eye and um, unbelievable. And I'm guessing you met Walter also working on talent industry on, on some of the sets of, of the films you worked on um, right is that is that correct I, I English patient actually well actually we met it's a funny funny story I was just getting involved in film at the time I was really like an apprentice editor so I came into the editing room and Walter was cutting the unbearable lightness of being at the time actually wow. and then uh, and he heard that there was a physicist in the building and Walter is fantastically interested in science and so he asked, and he had his assistant come down and see, uh, to see if I would go to lunch and talk to him about string theory. <laughs> and so we met talking about this, and then we did end up becoming friends and, and work, work together. We both became real collaborators with Anthony Mangella. And so we worked on the English Patient together, talented Mr. Ripley, Cold Mountain, and developed this friendship. And so at a certain point on particle fever, I, I made the call. I had moved to New York, and I had lived out in California where Walter was. And I was, uh, as I say, I... When I pulled the strings and just said, okay, you know, time now, payback for string theory is to come and work yeah, on it. For that, for that lunch, that crash, crash course. Right. Yeah. The, and if I'm correct, I remember you mentioning that particle fuel was maybe gonna, gonna be in, um, adapted into, into on, on Broadway, is this, is this right or? There is a, an effort to turn it into a musical, which, um, you know, my, um, Particle physics musical. That's uh... particle fever. The musical, yes, and um, no. It's uh, you know, it was my my uh, uh, international education distributor, Annie Roney, had had this idea, which seemed completely crazy and wild. And then I connected her with a New York producer, um, and who sparked to it. And you know, I still thought, and who knows, it may still be just a, a pipe dream. But uh, then they told me that they. David Henry Wang to write the script and that really sort of made it like really okay well who knows I mean again who knows what's going to happen now but there's um there's people that think that it could be I mean you know look it's a potentially beautiful big set and, you know uh it was a very dramatic story I mean it was a very dramatic story that uh we were very lucky to where, where can people Mark where can people watch these films I mean I know that bit player is playing on La Bocina but if they want to watch your your earlier films, um, it's on Particle Amazon now, actually, yeah, yeah. So Particle Fever is pretty generally available, actually. Yeah. I know it's 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 world world known, and and I'm excited that science is really becoming, you know, science cinema is really kind of 
being shown in different flavors. And it's really exciting to see these films get so much success. And it's also not only about the science, as you mentioned, but also about the characters behind it, which I know that's also a big part of Particle um, Fever is about the, you know, the people and, yeah. and that kind of longitudinal study of following these people for, for so long. Um, Mark, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. We definitely went over the hour that I had intended, uh, <laughs> but it's really fun. And, and I hope that everybody, you know, those watching now, I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, this will be available afterwards. And, uh, and please watch the bit player. If you have any questions, please uh, email us at, you know, at info at labocine.com or write in our Facebook. Um, and you know, we'll make sure to uh, share that with Mark and, and the IEEE team and, um, and everybody that's been involved with this film. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. We could speak for hours and hopefully we'll, we'll invite you again for, for the Goldberg thank area. You. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Uh, that's, the, that's the goal. So thanks and uh, good luck with La Bocine and uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. This was our first event with, with Mark. Take care. Bye-bye, Mark. Bye.